Hello everyone and welcome to lecture 71 of this series. This series of lecture is based on my book Manual of Fluid Electrolyte and Acid-Based Disorders, A Pathophysiologic Approach to Common Clinical Problems. I am Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I am a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. You can find the book on Amazon as an ebook, paperback, or hardcover. This is part five of chapter nine, metabolic alkalosis. This is the last part. And today we are going to do some case studies in metabolic alkalosis. Case number one is small bowel obstruction. A 74 year old man was admitted to the hospital with severe vomiting and abdominal pain due to small bowel obstruction. NG suctioning was started the next day. His labs were as follows, sodium a little bit low, 134, potassium remarkably low, 2.4, chloride is low, 92, bicarbonate is high, 36. His pH is elevated, 7.5, PaCO2 is 48, urine sodium is elevated at 41, while urine chloride is 4. How would you manage this patient? So obviously this patient has metabolic alkalosis due to vomiting. You can see that his pH is 7.5, so this is alkalemia. You look at the bicarbonate, it's elevated, it's 36. PSEO2 is high due to a respiratory compensation. So here, the respiratory compensation is adequate. If you uh, calculate it, uh, the expected value is very close to the uh, actual value. So how do we treat this patient? We need to do two things, like I said. You need volume repletion with 0.9 saline, isotonic saline. You need to replace both sodium and chloride. And most definitely, you need to replace potassium, not just to correct the alkalosis, but to avoid the complications of severe hypokalemia. So this is a very straightforward case, very common. And please notice that urine chloride was low. So this is a chloride-sensitive metabolic alkalosis due to decrease, to a decrease in effective arterial uh, circulatory volume or blood volume. Um, now, notice that the urine sodium is elevated because of the uh, excretion of sodium with the bicarbonate. So this is why we rely on urine chloride and not urine sodium. Case number two is acute congestive heart failure. We have a 55-year-old woman admitted to the hospital for management of acute on chronic systolic CHF or acute on chronic CHF with low ejection fraction. Ejection fraction is only 15%. She was started on furosemide, 80 milligrams intravenously every eight hours, and metolazone, 10 milligrams orally, daily. Symptoms improved, but she, remained she remains hypervolemic. On the third day, her labs were obtained. We have sodium of 144, so a little bit of hypernatremia expected with diuretics. Hypokalemia, potassium 3.2, also with diuretics. Chloride 100. Here we have a, a serum CO2 or bicarbonate of 38. So it's starting now to go up significantly. Magnesium, as you would expect, is low at 1.5. We do arterial blood gases and we have a pH of 7.5. So again, alkalemia, the bicarb is high, so you have metabolic alkalosis. PaCO2 is 50. So here also you have a respiratory compensation component. Urine sodium is 39. Urine chloride is 29. How would you manage the diuretic regimen now that you have, uh, you have metabolic alkalosis? So obviously the patient has metabolic alkalosis. Is it compensated? Well, we calculate the expected PaCO2. So it's 40 plus 0.2. And then we take the difference between 38 and 24 and we get 48.4. The actual is 50. So this is just a straightforward, simple acid-based disorder compensated metabolic alkalosis. Now, the uh, dose of furosemide and metolazone was cut in half 
because uh, we are having problems now with high sodium, low potassium, low magnesium, high bicarbonate, but it was not stopped. The diuretics were not stopped because the patient is still in acute CHF, still hypervolemic. Now, aggressively, we replaced both potassium and magnesium, and the patient was started on spironolactone, 25 milligram PO daily. This also helped uh, with the uh, preservation of potassium and magnesium, and it helps with CHF. Now, acetazolamide was going to be added if the above was not uh, effective. Uh, it was not added right away because it's very caluretic, so you would make the hypokalemia worse. Please keep that uh, in mind. So it was not necessary because the patient uh, improved. Case number three, we have a patient with severe sepsis and pulmonary edema. This is a 63-year-old man admitted to the intensive care unit for management of severe sepsis of urinary tract origin. On the second hospital day, he was in pulmonary edema and was started on bumetanide, a loop diuretic, one milligram intravenously every eight hours, and metolazone, five milligrams PO daily. The next day, his sodium was a little bit high, 145. Potassium is low at 3.3, chloride 106. And here we have a bicarbonate of 22, so a little bit low. Uh, we check a pH and it's 7.32. So uh, we call this, of course, acidemia and the bicarb is low. So do we have uh, metabolic acidosis? Do we have a mixed acid-based disorder? The PaCO2 is 44. The question is, what is the acid-based disorder? Do we have a simple acid-based disorder, like just metabolic acidosis, or do we have more? Let's look into this. So here we first look at the pH is 7.32, so this is acidemia, and we have a bicarbonate of 22, so this is metabolic acidosis. Now, we are going to uh, do a calculation. What is the expected PA PaCO2 for uh, a bicarbonate of 22? Well, it should be 38, but here we have it 44, so it's higher. So actually, uh, we don't just have metabolic acidosis, we have respiratory acidosis, so we have CO2 retention due to pulmonary edema. Okay, so now we have two acid-based disorders, metabolic acidosis and respiratory acidosis. What is the anion gap? Well, we calculate that and we easily get 17. Delta anion gap is 7, while delta bicarbonate is only 2. So here, uh, this, this means that we have a concomitant metabolic alkalosis because the bicarb is only 22, and it should be higher than that, uh, should be 7 based on an ion gap because they go together. And uh, the reason for that is the, uh, the use of, uh, of uh, diuretics. So here, we have a patient with triple acid-based disorder, which is, which is not uncommon in an ICU setting. You have an ion gap metabolic acidosis originated from the sepsis, usually lactic acidosis. You have metabolic alkalosis superimposed on the metabolic acidosis due to diuresis. And, and here uh, you have respiratory acidosis uh, due to pulmonary edema. Case number four, licorice and metabolic alkalosis. We have a 45-year-old man presenting with severe hypokalemia and metabolic alkalosis. Sodium 144, potassium is very low, 2.3, bicarbonate is 32. Blood pressure is elevated at 154 over 101 millimeters of mercury. A detailed dietary history revealed consumption of a large amount of licorice, which he uses as a snack. Is licorice causing this presentation with hypokalemia? with the metabolic alkalosis and hypertension? The answer is a resounding yes. The active metabolite in licorice is glyceretic acid, and this glyceretic acid is an inhibitor of the enzyme 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type 2. This enzyme normally converts cortisol, which is active, to cortisone, which is inactive. So if we inhibit this enzyme, we are going to have more cortisol, and cortisol is going to act like aldosterone. And what does aldosterone do? Aldosterone raises blood pressure, causes hypokalemia, and causes metabolic alkalosis. So uh, when you have a high enough level, high enough dose of cortisol, you will have a mineralocorticoid effect, 
similar to aldosterone. Now, please keep in mind that some tobacco products contain licorice. Some uh, uh, get uh, uh, chewed tobacco from Europe and it has licorice. So it's worth asking uh, if, uh, if you don't know the cause of metabolic alkalosis right away or the cause of hypertension and severe hypokalemia. Case number five. Uh, here we have a case of acute on chronic congestive heart failure. A 43-year-old woman received a large dose of diuretics for the management of acute on chronic systolic CHF or CHF with low ejection fraction. Fourth hospital day, uh, ABGs, arterial blood gases, were done on room air, and here we have a pH of 7.53, so here we have alkalemia. Is it respiratory? Is it metabolic? Let's go on. PaCO2 is 80. Uh, PA, uh, P, PaO2 uh, is 80. PaCO2 is 50. Bicarbonate is 40. Sodium is elevated at 150. Chloride is 105. Potassium is low at 3.4, serum bicarbonate is 39, and ion gap is 6. So here you have alkalemia, you look at the serum bicarbonate, it's elevated, so you do have metabolic uh, alkalosis. Now what is the acid-base disorder? So when I'm doing this, well obviously we have metabolic uh, alkalosis. Um, do we have uh, something else going on? Let's do some calculations. So when we do the calculations, the expected P PaCO2 is 40 plus 0 0.6, and then we take uh, uh, 40 minus 24. 40 is the, the current bicarbonate, minus 24 is a normal bicarbonate, and then uh, we get uh, our answer 49.6. So the actual uh, PaCO2 on the blood gas is 50, so they're, they're similar. So here we have a straightforward, simple acid-base disorder, which is compensated metabolic alkalosis. Um, well, I'm going to end here. I will see you in the next lecture where we are going to start to talk about respiratory acid-base disorders. See you then.